Hello guys, David Vos here. Oh buddy, it's a beautiful day here. It really is here in Alabama. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Guys, take a look on your screen. Have you ever seen that book? It's called The Harp of God. And it's kind of a neat looking book. I had seen it. I have seen one. Uh, been a long time. It's, they're almost impossible to come across now. I, I mean, they're certainly long out of print. But what's interesting about this ancient, old, out of print book, it was a book that Jehovah's Witnesses published way back in their early days, I think in 1920 or 21. This is not very long after 1914, 1918. When they were doing their their initial, you know, campaign upon the world, and so today we have like millions and millions of Jehovah's Witnesses all around the world. Now, most people say, "Well, how big is Jehovah's Witnesses? How many millions are you talking about?" Well, until the last P A N D M I C whatever thing came through, up until that point. I guess there were many, many millions. Now they've tried to go back to the Kingdom Hall because they shut down for a period of time. They didn't go to the Kingdom Hall. And I guess only about half really want to go back to the Kingdom Hall. But you hear a lot of people saying, well, what difference does it make? These, this is a little group. It's a little cult. They don't have very many people. I mean, you know, there's a billion Catholics. I mean, what do you care about a couple of million Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, it's not really what it appears. You <laughs> see, because... They don't count membership like Catholics or whatever. They only count people who go from door to door. Now, this is what's going to shock you. The actual figures that I'm going to show you is going to completely blow your mind. But, and this is not some figure that most people have ever heard of, but actual kingdom halls where Jehovah's Witnesses go to meet. There are about 130,000 kingdom halls in the world. There are over 11,000 kingdom halls in the United States. Now, they've been selling them off in the last year or so. I don't know how many there are today. But, you know, probably 2020 or something like that. There were about 100, or I said about 11,000 kingdom halls in the United States. And worldwide, 130,000 kingdom halls. Well, that's just a figure. It means nothing to us. Well, how many... Physical Catholic churches are there in the world? I had to do some digging to find out. Some said there were 230,000 or something. That's actually parishes. And some parishes, or parishes, however they pronounce it, actually have more than one church in their parish. So, of all told, physical churches of the Catholic Church, there was, from what figures I've seen, there are about 271,000 Catholic churches in the world. That's only... Just slightly over double. And when you include all of the other properties that Jehovah's Witnesses have, like they have these big convention centers, they have, they have these, they purchased and own assembly halls and other halls and buildings where they meet. So all told, there's well over 130,000 kingdom halls in the world, about half of the number of Catholic churches. Well, that's quite a bit, because if there's over a billion Catholics or something like that, then you can see just how many Jehovah's Witnesses there might actually be, or how much they've influenced the world in their teachings. So, you can look at it this way. There are countries where when you're born, you're baptized without your own even knowledge of it. They sprinkle you or baptize you in some way. And so, you're, you go down in a registry as Christian. And if you were baptized by a Catholic, they count you in their numbers. So there could be millions and millions of people running around France or, or, or Spain or Italy or wherever that are marked as Catholic, but they haven't gone to a Catholic cathedral church in decades, or maybe they never went after they were initially brought by their grandma in there and sprinkled and declared a, a Catholic. So infant baptism and certain practices amongst other churches, even Lutherans and other types of religions 
they count only those members baptized. Whereas Jehovah's Witnesses count only the people who regularly go out from door to door. So if they say they have 8 million people going around from door to door, imagine if there were 8 million Catholics zealous enough for that religion to go out and actively campaign day in, day out, 7 days a week, 24 hours a day, 30 days in the month, 360 days of a year, actively going around, knocking on doors, campaigning, soliciting, and giving talks, and giving Bible studies, and doing all of this. You see? So basically, the number of people they claim to be Jehovah's Witnesses are just their clergy. They have many more what we would call laity in other churches. And they have influenced the world in so many different ways, not just in their teachings and their literature, they're changing Christianity literally, but also with their lawyers, they've changed the uh, Constitution of the United States. They've, they've fought certain laws in the court system. Kind of like the ACLU. They, they're very proud of that. Medical things and, you know, issues about saluting the flag and people going to school and not going to war and all these different cases in court. Well, there's more. So, we said Catholics claim to have over a billion members. Well, it's actually, I guess, 1.3 billion. But there's not as many, there's only so many of these churches where people go, and they don't go on a regular basis. Many Catholics would be lucky to go once a year on Easter to their church. And many Catholics were baptized as a baby and never went back again. And they, at this time, actually be Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or Adventists or some other Protestant. They may be attending some Baptist church and they could be a member of both churches. So the number 1.3 billion Catholics is a fraud. You see, there are organizations that are undercover, like Jehovah's Witnesses, that don't publish the number of people that they have and don't publish the influence that they have. They pretend that they're not into politics, that they don't run for office, that they're just not influential people. And yet these are the people that are the elite. They created this secret society that has literally taken over the entire world. There are many ways that we can show this. Jehovah's Witnesses have done more to publish and propagandize and change the world's teachings than any other organization. Now, you can take, for instance, Seventh-day Adventists and say, well, they changed the world because if it weren't for them, people wouldn't even know about the Sabbath. All right, we'll give them that. They have changed the world. Now, not for the good, because as we have pointed out, Jesus didn't teach the Sabbath. When they asked him, why don't you keep the Sabbath? He didn't say, oh, yes, I do. No, Jesus said, because my father keeps on working and I keep on working. We just discussed in a prior video a few days ago how Jehovah's Witnesses did this huge campaign and won and convinced the entire world that the Bible that they had used for 2,000 years was no longer accurate and they remade the Bible based on the Masoretic text. Well, the King James Bible had already collaborated with the Masoretic scribes when it was published in 1611 because the Freemasons were in cahoots with the Catholic Church, but they couldn't just spring it on the world. So what they did was just say Lord everywhere and kind of confuse the issue. But Christians per se still believed that Jesus was their Lord and Savior and a Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost and the immortal soul and all of that. Well, Catholics couldn't just come along one day and say, oh, we've been taken over by the Judeans and now we don't believe in all that. So what they did was they just sort of pretended that they were the worldwide Christian church that had no uh, membership, really. They were all filing off into Protestant churches. And Protestants were, you know, again, say, well, we're Christians, but I, all, all, we, you know, all we're going to get out to the world, all we're going to do, us Lutherans and Baptists, is tell the world we don't have to be Catholics anymore. That'll open the field so now we can finance these major modern American religions that are made out of whole cloth. 
that are literally Judaism in, in sheep's clothing, like Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists and keeping the Sabbath, and, and the Worldwide Church of God by Herbert Armstrong go back to the the holy days and 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 all these laws and and this fellowshipping and basic spiritual murdering of people who don't follow what you believe back the same thing that that the catholics themselves tried to do with the inquisitions but jehovah's witnesses was their main squeeze they financed them they put the watchtower bible and tract society this big huge building right as you're going over the brooklyn bridge boom there you see it right next across the street from the united nations building, there's the Trump Plaza, there's the Rockefeller Plaza, there's the United Council of Churches, and then, oh, there's the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Not a Christian church. They never claim to be Christian. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe that Jesus is the Lord. They don't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe in your immortal soul. They don't believe in anything that Christians ever believed in, but neither did the rest of the Christians until they came along and started publishing this stuff and declaring to the world that it was all the real truth and that the Catholics had lied. It was really Catholics trying to shift all of the teachings into another organization. The membership was now filing into other organizations and they were using a select group of worker workers to go and canvas the world and put the fires out in hell, which is exactly how they put it. Millions now living will never die and Judge Rutherford put the fires out in hell. Right, And Charles Taze Russell declared that we are now in Jehovah's kingdom, announcing it because Jesus has come invisibly in the heavens and Zionism is going to be the great thing and we're going to restore Israel and the New World Order. And then they published the New World Order Bible, which is locked completely stock barrel exactly down the line with the Masoretic scribes and the view that only Jehovah was the true deity, which Christians had never believed. But now they had convinced the world with their new Bible, all their literature, and everything else. So that means if they've got 8 million people, they're actually, there's 8 million running around going from door to door, and there could be millions more that just go to the meetings from time to time. You say, well, they only go once or twice a year. They're not really Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, if they keep going back every year, to attend their memorial, then they obviously that's how they believe. They may be inactive. They're not going from door to door doing everything they're supposed to do. Many of them, though, still hold these basic beliefs. But you see, it's not even about the people who declare themselves Jehovah's Witnesses or believe like that. They've convinced the entire world to some degree. So most of the world now doesn't believe Jesus is God. Most of the world is you know, they have sort of an apathetic belief. They don't really care if there's a trinity. They think it's some, some symbolic thing and Jesus was just a man after all. He wasn't really deity and it's just another religion and there really isn't any hell. It's all symbolic. We're not going to be punished if we uh, don't accept Jesus and um, they don't teach the mother anymore. What a clever way to get rid of the divine being. One third of the divine being, well, no, two thirds of the divine being, and the other third that we think we still have, the Father, is not even the same person. They've switched it over to the devil. What a plot! The entire world is accepted, not just Jehovah's Witnesses, and it and it wasn't just Jehovah's Witnesses teaching all of this. It was modern Adventists and you know uh, sacred names and then uh, whatever these uh, Jews for Jesus or whatever. It was all a concerted effort. All of it was financed. Just like the Moonies or Hare Krishna or whatever, for whatever reasons they had to finance them in that particular area of the world. In, in South Korea, they created the Moonies because it was a political movement, just like this other stuff that we're talking about, these other churches, are political financial plots from the New World Order propaganda. Friends, if you think I'm saying that only Jehovah's Witnesses are involved with this, no, no, no. Listen carefully. They have, every one of these religions have a political reason. So Luther nailed his thesis on a church door and created the Protestant movement, supposedly, but it was a political movement. Luther was 
one of these Freemasons, so was Charles Taze Russell, a Freemason. We have proven that beyond a shadow of a doubt. All the Freemasonry Templar symbolisms of all of their original books. And so were all of the other... Brigham Young was a Freemason who murdered Joseph Smith. And most of these particular people we're calling Freemasons were a organization created from John D. and Edward Kelly from Bavaria, and they were linked to the Bavarian Illuminati. And they had a purpose. And every one of these organizations, Calvin was a political organization, not a religion, friends. Stop. Stop getting involved in these political organizations run by Satan to destroy and deceive the world. And you're a member. Presbyterians, they're all full of rich bankers. It's a political organization. Even the Quakers. All of it. And each of them had a purpose. But in these latter days, Jehovah's Witnesses were used heavily to canvas the world. And as we've proven in other videos, they are the ones who made the first motion picture. They sent, Charles Russell sent Judge Rutherford to California, created Hollywood, created the record, the record player, the phonographs and all of this. And they undercover, under their corporate, you know, entities and loopholes, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society own billions of companies, multi-billion dollar companies like AT&T. They own it. So it is not a significant organization. The members are the elite that are ruling over you. Members of these religions are the elite that are lying and deceiving you, knowing full well that they're lying. And I'm going to show you that right here. Watch this. They pulled this trick on us over and over and over again. Watch carefully. Remember, this book, The Harp of God, was published in, I think, 1921. Just a few short years after 1914, when their great prophecy did not happen. But I want to read to you what little shenanigans they're pulling, what proof that, that everything that they've been saying for a hundred years in the Watchtower has been an outright lie, a scam, a hoax. You must not be fooled. Let me read you, if you ever thought maybe Jehovah's Witnesses were right, and you, you, you don't know or are not familiar with their original literature, I will show you that they have not just made a mistake, but they are literally lying to you right at this very moment. The entire thing's a scam. Let me read this to you. This is going to blow your mind. So it says, Our Lord's Return. It says, um, Depends upon accurate calculations, and there is always some possibility of mistakes. Fulfilled prophecy is the record of physical facts which are actually extant and definitely fixed. Physical facts do not stultify themselves. They stand as silent witnesses whose testimony must be taken as indisputable. So they're not just you know, saying maybe. This is what they're going to say here. What they taught in 1921, they claim was indisputable. They said there are two important dates here that we must not confuse, but clearly differentiate. Namely, the beginning of the time of the end and the presence of the Lord. The time of the end embraces a period from A.D. 1799, as above indicated, to the time of the complete overthrow of Satan's empire and the establishment of the kingdom of the Messiah, the time of the Lord's second presence dates from 1874. As above stated, the latter period is within the first named, of course, and at the latter part of the period known as the time of the end. Friends, do you see what's going on here? In 1921, they were still teaching what they had taught before 1914. Remember, this whole organization, the whole Watchtower thing, we're called Bible Students, started way back in 1860 or 74 or something. So they were preaching for years before 1914. And at that time, all the way up to 1921 and beyond, they were teaching that the time of the end started in 1799. That's the same 
teachings that the Adventists had been teaching. I mean, William Miller came along in 1800 or something, and uh, 1830 started preaching that the world was coming to an end in 1844. So this is what the whole Advent movement, they were teaching this for years, it didn't happen, so then a guy named Barber came along and switched it a little bit, said, well, it wouldn't, wouldn't happen until 1874, not 1844. So jo Russell came along and said, oh yeah, 1874, we, did, you know, we just made a little mistake, it's not 1844, it's 1874. And then that didn't happen. So when it didn't happen in 1874, they said, well, that's just the time when Jesus came in his invisible presence. See, and by the year 1914, everything would be destroyed. So 1914 comes along, and they slowly start doing the little tricky switchy Rooney thing on us, and going back and changing all the dates. But the exact same teachings that they've been doing, they've already switched them three or four different times, starting off with 1830 and 1844. 1799 was the beginning of the end, according to Adventists, and then 1844 would be the whole end. And when that didn't happen, well, we'll just move it up. We'll just keep moving it up. So today, you, you know, for 100 years or 150 years, Jehovah's Witnesses would disfellowship you, ruin you, completely destroy you, condemn you to eternal destruction. If you didn't believe in 1914, when they had already changed it, knowingly from 1844 to 1914 to on and on they had dates all the way up to i think the year 2000 but the last big one was 1975 which i was at that time that's when my family left or was thrown out on our ear but what this is like have you ever heard the expression they move the mile marker so they say, okay, I'm going to put this marker here. It's a mile marker. You take off running. When you get to this mile marker, I'll give you uh, uh, a glass of water and some money or whatever. They're going to give you a reward, a prize. You get to the mile marker and then they move it. And they move it up a mile. And they say, okay, you got to get to the mile marker. What are you doing? Get, go, get running. Go. You'll give you a prize if you get there. So just about the time you start to get to the mile marker, they move it up further again. You never get to the mile marker. So these evil, wicked liars have been prophesying. No, they haven't. They've been lying. Well, isn't that what Yahweh does? He sends his lying spirits. We've covered this in many other videos. But it's just a hoax. They keep saying, well, the end's coming in 1844. Well, I guess it'll, it'll be 1864. Well, I guess it's 1874. Well, I guess it's you know, 1884. Well, I guess it's 1914. Well, I guess it's 1918. Well, I guess it's 1921 or 1930 something or 33 or 1941. I think they had a date. And there was a whole bunch. I can't even remember them all. But it's not just that they keep moving the date. They keep sw moving the entire philosophy where they have this period of time at the end and then the last days and the very last days and then the the moment when Christ's presence comes and there's a great tribulation, but the world don't know it because it's invisible. This whole scenario, they did it way back before 1914. And we will show you, apps, well, I can't in this video, but there is Watchtower articles, Kingdom Ministry uh, articles. And there are books that they wrote which deliberately and literally and completely and absolutely say that the end of the world would be in 1914 or other dates that they had chosen at different times. And every time they said it was Jehovah that spoke it, they did claim to be prophets. And today, they're only obfuscating. And and by the way, the whole concept of 1914 just being the last days has been proven wrong. The last generation. Because it's now 2022. Which means it's been a hundred and what is it eight years since 1914 but remember they taught that you had to be alive in 1914 and you had to be able to witness it so they said people that were like 15 years old would never die well then they later on down the road changed it to well you had to be like maybe nine years old and then you would never die here in 1921 in this book at the bottom of that green book you see millions now living will never die 1921 so people that were living in 1921, maybe 10, 20 years old, would never die. Well, 
if you were 20 years old in 1921, that would mean you'd be 122 years old today. They're gone. The generation is past. And see, that's not even scriptural anyway. The Bible says the generation is 60 or 70 years, 80 if they're mighty. So they have literally exposed themselves and anybody who believes this is deluding themselves. But here's the thing that we want to talk about. It isn't just, well, you know, I was wrong. It's just, you know, it's the best religion, whatever. It just, you know, maybe we're wrong, but, you know, we're still right. That's not the way you look at this. What you're doing by, by telling the world that if they don't believe this, they're condemned to eternal destruction, you're condemning your own soul to eternal destruction. Because Jesus said, whatever judgment you met out, it will be meted out to you in return. Jesus himself does not judge you. He offers you eternal life. But all you have to do is receive it, and you must receive it. If you don't receive eternal life for you and everyone else, forgiving everyone else so that you can be forgiven. Jesus said, if you'll just forgive your neighbor, your brother, I'll forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive them, if you condemn the world, then you will be condemned. People, do you not see what I'm saying here? You must Love your brother or you will not have eternal life at this point. You will eventually come to the Lord, whether it be willingly or finally after you have received all of the judgments that you've meted out and the condemnation that you've given the rest of the world has been put upon you and you went through this, you know, time of a thousand years where you will be reign, reigned over by this God of judgment. Remember, Jesus said, I do not condemn you. You have one that condemns you, and that is Moses. I have come to give you life, and that more abundantly. But if you reject it, then Paul says you remain under the curse. You will receive the wrath that is to come. It's as simple as that, because you would not receive the love of the truth that you might be saved. So, there are... Like, for instance, there are 70,000 people, or I should say, I think, yeah, I think 70,000 people that just, I think, are disfellowshipped every year. I believe there are, there are, sometimes the figures go up and down. It may be more like 100,000 per year that just get disfellowshipped. And I think about that every year, how many people that were witnesses but no longer are witnesses and can never come back and they're shunned. So there's millions more that are really Jehovah's Witnesses in their mind unless they're sitting around with a bottle of tequila or, or something at night, you know, and they end up dying of cancer, heart disease or whatever because of their, their emotional distress, which, you know, is happening to many of them. Some of them even suicide. But the number of individuals that believe in Jehovah's Witnesses enough in any one given year to attend the meetings, not to be a regular participant, you know, going from door to door, giving talks and elders and bishops and all of that and putting money in the pot. They all do that. But the number of people that believe kind of have relatives that are in and so therefore they think like is up in the millions and millions. And I think the number of people that attend their memorial meeting every year is about 20 million. I think it's over 20 million people now. So again, that's not the largest group in the world, but remember, the number of people that they're affecting, that they've changed their faith. I mean, basically, all of Christianity has now accepted Jehovah as their deity, whereas a hundred years ago, people did not believe in that. Basically, in the last hundred years, 50, 200 years, or whatever Jehovah's Witness is doing all this preaching, they've taken hell out of people's minds. They don't believe in hell or fear it anymore. They don't believe in the punishment of eternal suffering. They don't believe in the eternal soul. They don't believe in life after this. They don't believe in Jesus' deity. They don't believe in the Mother Mary. They don't believe in anything. And, by the way, every year at a specific point when Jesus had the Last Supper, they get together and mock it. They all get together and pass around his body and blood and reject it, which is called the Black Mass. So they are the biggest, largest, satanic, hating, uh, Jehovah-worshipping religion in the world, almost rivaling Jews itself. And as we'll see, are a product of Jews. 
and financed by them. And their main, one of their main ways to have a group of elite that run all the businesses of the world that are basically, they're not just ordinary people, these Jehovah's Witnesses. They run all your organizations, your corporations, their CEOs. They're running around suit and ties. They're, they're writing everything down in their journal. They're keeping track of what you're doing. They're telling on each other. They're, they're literally publishing the new world, you know, altering the Bible, canvassing the world with tracts, having the largest conventions of any other organization, international assemblies and conventions, and just mass teachings and propaganda around the world more than any other organization on the face of the earth, only rivaled by maybe the Mormons or something of that effect. But I only say that because Jehovah's Witnesses are not just some small cult. And you have to understand that there isn't just 8 million Jehovah's Witnesses. There are millions upon millions upon millions that are running around affected by their doctrines and teachings, walking around in a stupor. Now, the same thing goes for maybe Adventists and Mormons and Catholics and basically Lutherans and Baptists and every other religion. And everything that I'm going to tell you about Jehovah's Witnesses is only an example because basically on some lower level or even on a par with Jehovah's Witnesses, for some people, their cultic evil teachings are affecting the world in the same way. And you can basically apply this to any religion. So those of you who say, well, I never was a Jehovah's Witness, so I don't need to watch this. Well, you do, because maybe you used to be a Mormon or an Adventist or a Baptist or a Mooney or a, or a, or a Hare Krishna or whatever you were, were. You need to be familiar with these tactics and understand what's really going on. It is a huge brainwashing, and you need to understand that you cannot just silently watch on without speaking up and speaking out. It's literally going to mean your very eternal salvation, what you do about the knowledge that you have. So let me show you from the very get-go. I just want to briefly read this little article here. It's uh, one of the pages in this book, The Harp of God, what they said, because we're going to talk about this. This is going to blow your mind and any ex-Jehovah's Witness that sees this will literally have a crisis of conscience. Now, they've lost a lot of people over the last two years. and But you see, that doesn't mean they that they no longer believe they're Jehovah's Witnesses because if they publicly say they're doubting about anything or whatever, they'll be shunned and they'll never see their family again. So most Jehovah's Witnesses or a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses today are more or less in name only. They don't go out from door to door anymore, which that's an important thing for people to understand. It is a crucial thing because there it was some years ago, I think they did this actually twice because once in 1914, the government stopped the work of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society saying it was illegal or whatever. And they declared that that was something scriptural, that it was profound. It was the, it was the devil trying to murder their, the two witnesses. They claimed they were the two witnesses that would preach in the last days for three and a half years. And so they found a little period of time from 1914 to 1918. And they just, de they decided that, that their watchtower was preaching the, the gospel into every nation. And they said, look how many watchtowers we sold and how many books. And here was one of the books that they sold. Right, here was one of their books. And wait till you see what this book says. Because if you have ever been a Jehovah's Witness, if you've ever known any of them, and you know anything about them, you'll know how important it is to understand that this book was there, what they were saying, and get the facts so we can get this out to people. But there was another time, I think, in World War II when the Germans tried to shut down the preaching work of Jehovah's Witnesses, and they declared they themselves were the, uh, in the book of Daniel, it was, a, it was a fulfillment of prophecy, according to them, that the constant feature would be removed. Now, that in itself is probably a blasphemous statement by Jehovah's Witnesses. And yet millions of 
well, at the time, there were hundreds of thousands of Job's Witnesses that accepted it with glee and never questioned it. But the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society has been known to say some very, you know, blasphemous things. I mean, they, they, people say, oh, that Pope, he's always declaring himself to be the vicar of Christ or or uh, God in the flesh or something, you know, whatever they, they claim. And it's blasphemy, you know. But the truth is, Jehovah's Witnesses have made more blasphemous claims than I think than any other organization that's ever been. And we will prove are not only just false prophets, I mean, period. Under their own laws and beliefs, under the Jewish system that they evidently are proclaiming all over the world, announcing Jehovah and his kingdom and his laws, right? All the principles of the law. Well, and and by the way, you say, oh yeah, but they don't believe in sacrifice. You know, we're not going to start up sacrifices anymore. They don't believe in the law, David. Well, yes, they do. They believe that Jesus was a sacrifice to Jehovah, a sweet smelling savor. So this is the eternal sacrifice. And so they then went from an, a literal understanding of the Old Testament to a spiritual one, which all Judeans have done. That's what the Talmud is. That's what uh, Jewish oral tradition has been saying for a long time. That's what Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism, teaches. It's all spiritual now. That the whole world, the Adam Kadmon, the whole world is a spiritual... Uh, the, 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 the patterns that were re given to Moses represent the whole universe. And in some sense, they're correct. But what we're going to show is Jehovah's Witnesses are not teaching anything different than Judaism, right straight from the Talmud. There is no temple for, you know, Judeans for, I don't know, a couple thousand years have not had anywhere to worship other than their synagogue. And they taught that when the Bible was written, there wasn't a literal temple, there was literal laws, there were you know, they had a literal nation. But now that the Judeans were scattered all over the world and so forth, and this is before 1948 when they had, you know, gone back to the land of Palestine, they taught that we would understand the Old Testament spiritually. This is exactly what Jehovah's Witnesses did since 1874. Friends, you have to understand this. I, I hope I'll be able to explain this to you clearly. It isn't just Jehovah's Witnesses or a religion that is trying to tell you that the Bible to be interpreted their way and here's the books and here's how to interpret it. We're the truth. It's the whole world. They are teaching it at various levels from different pulpits, but the mesmerization, the teachings are going worldwide. So the entire world now are under this symbolic Old Testament. So you don't go to a temple court to be judged. Now you just go to the court in your local town, which is an extension of the court of the Jewish temple. And you put your hand on a Bible. But don't put your hand on the interpretation of the Bible that Jesus set you free. But only in the interpretation of the law of Moses. Moses is the basis of law and government. And therefore you will receive a mark on your hand or your forehead or you will not buy or sell. The mark on your hand or your forehead is the law of Moses. Read it in Deuteronomy. The entire world is based upon the type that is written in the law of Moses. So there were originally ten commandments, and most people think that's the first ten. That's not true. If you read it carefully, the ten commandments are only ten uh, groupings of all the other commandments would always add to 10, the complete law. So at the end, you had 613 laws. Well, 6 and 1 is 7 and 3 is 10. 613 adds to 10. And it continues by that. See, that is a symbolic reference to the fact that the laws will never end. They'll end up with uh, the geometric evaluation of 10, but it could be millions upon zillions of laws just know that it is all based upon the ten and it is based upon Jehovah and swear in the name of Jehovah, which is taking his name in vain, as we talked about the other day. This entire system 
everything. They used to do dramas in the temple. Now they're doing dramas on the television. You see, they used to have priests with robes. Now we still have priests with robes. I mean, the, the court, they have the black robes because they're hiding, they're cloaking the truth. They're admitting that. The white collar underneath is the white purity of truth that they're cloaking with their black robes. And you go to school and you learn nonsense and you get a black robe and a square hat, which is Saturn, which is the Sabbath, which is Yahweh's beliefs and deception and material universe that puts you under slavery. So slavery, well, slavery was done away, Dave. No, it isn't. It's called work now. The word is an, a more modern word for slavery. It's the same word. You work, you slave, you serve. And you're an indentured servant because when you're born, you're written, you're, you sign your name to a bond paper. Your mother signs your name, which is bond paper, which means you're a bond servant. And every contract that you, from that point forward, sign, you sign it on bond paper because you're a bond servant and you're a slave and you were obedient to the government and you were bound under the laws of this world. And I want to share with you some profound things, so please stay tuned. But what I was saying is that Jehovah's Witnesses worship Jehovah, just like the Judeans did, the religion of Judea, and believed practically right down the middle exactly the way that Judeans had been teaching for the 2,000 years preceding that time. What they did was come up with some ideas that the world was about to end and it was time to set up the new world order, which is the plan that they have carried out since that time. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society was literally financed by the, we'll call them elders of some particular mountain. And if you want to know what mountain, just look at the Watchtower. It says, Announcing Jehovah's Kingdom. Zion's watchtower. So the watchtower, they were up on their watchtower waiting for his kingdom and they were going to announce it on their watchtower. They were looking, they could see the events coming and it was Mount Zion, which they quoted Isaiah chapter 8 all the time that in the latter days, the mountain, the Lord's house shall be established above the top of the mountains. And of course that was being done since 1914, 1917, they began to go back to the land of their inheritance, supposedly. And in 1948, they became a state. Well, up to that point, Jehovah's Witnesses was teaching a literal restoration of Israel. They were teaching that they were the chosen people. There were two hopes. Today, they've changed it and people are un unaware of this. They've got this idea with 144,000 and the great multitude are two different hopes. One is the heavenly hope, one is the earthly hope, and it would be a paradise earth and so forth. Well, it wasn't the way they originally taught that. Originally, they they talked about something that nowadays Jehovah's Witnesses don't use that phrase, but they used to say the faithful worthies. The faithful worthies and the ancient patriarchs and the old Judean people such as Moses and Abraham and, and all of the, you know, the children of Israel, they were going to come back and their numbers would be 144,000. And after they would, be, their numbers would fulfill, he would turn his attention to the world and there would be a thousand years. And this heavenly kingdom or this governmental authority of Jehovah's spiritual kingdom, which is what Judeans had been teaching all these years. They never really thought that, that, you know, there was all, certainly some, uh, schools of thought amongst those what will we call them? Our overlords. Let's stop saying elite. Let's call them the overlords. Around the world, there were various ideas and schools, but most of them did not have really any beliefs that somehow they would go back to their land and build another temple and start up all these laws. They kind of thought, well, the synagogue took its place. It's all spiritual now. We can't go to the temple and sacrifice. So there had to be a fulfillment. So, Jesus was a literal sacrifice to Jehovah, their deity. And he paid for your sins. He, he spilled his blood 
And their God, Jehovah, accepted that as a human sacrifice. It's funny because I just was watching this uh, Rabbi Tovia or whatever, I'm not, a singer or something, and he's trying to discredit Christianity by saying that Jehovah never believed in sacrifice or human sacrifice. And the, Christianity is the worship of a deity that demands human sacrifice, which their God never would do, which if I had three hours right now, I would prove to you that Judaism and the entire Old Testament does teach that you must sacrifice your firstborn son. Yahweh demanded it. Jehovah demanded the death of your firstborn child. But if you did not want to give your firstborn child, you could redeem it with a lamb. And this was the whole point that Jesus would come and he would be the lamb. He would die for us. And But now, wait a minute, Dave. Don't you believe that Jesus died for you? Yes, I do. But you see, I do not believe that Jehovah is my deity. And so it was Jehovah that demanded the firstborn, which is contrary to what these rabbis are saying. But that is really what the Old Testament teaches. It's what Jehovah's Witnesses teach, that Jehovah is a vengeful deity. That he runs, the, he's the father, he's greater than Jesus. And he's got all these laws. And since nobody could ever keep these laws, somebody had to make a sacrifice and it was Jesus Christ. See, we don't teach that here. And the New Testament does not teach that. What the New Testament teaches, early Christians taught that Yahweh, Gyaldaboth, that's what they originally, early first century Christians called Jehovah a lot of times, Eyaldaboth. And they called him the devil. They called him the liar. They called him the deceiver. And they said he demanded sacrifice. He had all these laws. We were under his curse. And Jesus paid the price, not to his own father. Jesus didn't like the idea of human sacrifice. Jesus wasn't complying with human sacrifice. What Jesus was doing was being condemned by a vengeful deity who demanded his blood. He didn't submit to it, but he simply understood that he had no authority in this world. And he simply said, all right, Yahweh, do whatever you must. Get this done quickly, Judas, because... I'm trying to leave this world. Now, there's only one way to get into this world, and that's through birth. And the only way to leave this world is through death. And Jesus said, I'm leaving to go unto my Father. Now, all you guys take up your cross and follow me, the God of love. My kingdom is no part of this world. So this is completely a lie. Well, there's many, many lies as we will reveal to you along the road. But what I was saying originally was that um, they began to teach, Jehovah's Witnesses began to teach, they were the constant feature. It changed. You see, it wasn't some literal temple where they did some sacrifices and had some sort of you know, way of worshiping this Jehovah in some literal fashion. But that after a certain point, since Christ came and, and changed it, and, and now it was all spiritual, that they were going to have to fulfill all these laws in some spiritual way. And so the, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses themselves, when their preaching activity ceased, because of some German law that refused to allow them to go from door to door. That was the the stopping of the constant feature. There's all these little things and tricks that they've been playing. And I will show you by the end of this video, friends, and you should share this with anybody who knows anything about witnesses or is stuck in that religion. If you can get them to watch this, and they will listen all the way through. There's no way on this earth that anyone, after this video could say, okay, I still believe in Jehovah's Witness. I think they're right. If they would say that, they're willingly ignorant. And, well, we'll have some things to say about that here in a little while. But, look at that picture there, the harp of God. And if you'll notice, at the bottom of that green book, it says, proof that millions now living will never die. Hmm, well, most, I think a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses know that there was a time when they used to teach that. But I think a lot of them thought, well, it was, you know, not that long ago, and it's still true, because there may still be some people left in the world that haven't died. And besides, even if they were wrong, well, 
the Lord's always given us new light and, you know, things change and, and they're, they never claim to be a prophet, Dave. They're just trying to, to, to help. But, well, that's not true. They did claim to be a prophet. Uh, Charles Taze Russell did. It was written in the watchtowers and stuff that he was a prophet and he made specific claims. And it says in their law in the Old Testament that if anyone presumes to speak in the name of Jehovah and what he prophesies does not come true, that prophet must be identified as a false prophet and the words they spoke were not from Jehovah. And that prophet must be stoned to death. Now, if they don't believe in literal stoning, then at least they would shun them, right? We would disassociate ourselves from those people who teach these things because they're false prophets according to their own beliefs. But none of Jehovah's Witnesses ever got the memo. But it's more specific. They didn't just make a couple of statements that could be construed as false prophecy. I want to show you that they have not only prophesied falsely over and over and over and, and egregiously so, but they have lied about it even more times than they've prophesied about it. They have lied extensively to the point where they know that they're lying and they know they're lying right through their teeth. And this is not only wrong to deceive the entire world, but it is hypocrisy and it is slavery to keep people in slavery to your false teachings, knowing that, that, that you're enslaving them, that, that what, not only what you're saying is wrong, but what you're saying is evil, that you're punishing people for using their own mind and thinking about things in a rational way, keeping them in mental slavery. And if they try to wake up, you shun them and, and you, in other words, think about this under their own law, you had to stone a false prophet. That means, okay, right off that, you see, well, that must mean then they, they, they should be stoned, right? Well, I wouldn't stone them because that's not my belief, but their beliefs are. Now, you notice, remember what Jesus taught. Jesus said that give and you shall receive. This is the kind of thing, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, they're not certainly not doing unto us that, the way they want us to do unto them. They want us to be tell the truth, they want us to do everything they say and believe them. But all, not only that, Jesus specifically said, whatever you judge another, the same judgment will come upon you. And if you honestly know that the person who's, that you're condemning, that you're heaping all these coals of fire upon their head, and all this judgment, and you're heaping this upon them, then that judgment will come upon you. See, even Jesus can't save you. Because Jesus said, listen, I'm going to offer you eternal life, and whoever receive it openly and freely with their heart, will I will give them eternal life. All you have to do is accept it. But anyone who refuses it, rejects the love of the truth that they might be saved, shall get the strong delusion. And they will be as Jesus say, as Paul says, they will remain under this curse because they have rejected the freedom, the truth. They rejected the truth that they might be saved. So, this is why Jesus said, happy are the peacemakers, for theirs is the kingdom of the divine being. But woe unto you, scribes, who falsify the scriptures and teach false doctrine and weigh people down with heavy laden with sins and, and, and make them twofold a child of hell and, 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 and deceive and lie and hurt and maim and, 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 oh, the judgment comes and there will be the gnashing and the weeping of their teeth and they will not come out of there until they've paid the last penny, Jesus said. Your house is left unto you desolate. I condemn you. Because you will not simply receive with humility the love of the truth that you might be saved. So this isn't just Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, you know, I think if you're somebody like a Jehovah's Witnesses walking around giving your statement and teaching directly to people that they are going to lose their eternal life and be damned forever, and yet you knowingly 
understand that that is wrong, I think that judgment comes back onto you, especially. But the entire world is in this predicament. And this is why Jesus said these things. This is the judgment. Jesus gave us everything we need to know to get through these trying times. Because here we are faced with all these lies. And Jesus said, please don't go after them. Don't believe them. For false prophets and false Christ will arise and, and, and deceive many. Please don't believe them. I've forewarned you. Don't go after them. Oh, he's in the inner chambers. He's coming his secret coming. He's invisibly present in the heavens in 1914. And, and only we have the truth and we're the mouthpiece of Jehovah. And we sit in the seat of Moses. Do as we say, not as we do. Then Jesus said, he will come in an hour in which you know not. And there shall be the weeping and the gnashing of your teeth. This is the, the measure. This is the reason for the judgment of this world. Because, you see, this is why the Lord had to allow the wheat and the weeds to grow up together. The sheep and the goats. Because, you see, how can you reward someone if they've never been or had a trial? This is the trial, the judgment. And the wicked will do wicked, but the righteous shall shine as the stars, bringing the many to righteousness. You see, you must make a decision now. Like Elihu, the prophet said, how long will you limp upon two opinions? You see, you must either love your neighbor or hate your neighbor. And you know in your own heart if you are loving your neighbor. Are you helping people? Are you running around preaching propaganda, you know, hate, vengeance. That's the wrong deity. Jesus taught love. You're not following Jesus. And therefore, the love of the truth, you did not receive, you rejected it. This, then, the words of Jesus and the prophets will be the basis for your judgment. It's simple as this. Give and ye shall receive. Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. As you forgive others, the Father forgives you. Whatever you judge, whatever you met out in judgment to others, will be meted out back unto you. So if you refuse to forgive and love your neighbor, then you'll find yourself at this point in time, the great judgment, it's all going to come down and back upon you like karma. So you better wake up and start loving your neighbor Time is running short, my friends. You must stand up and speak out. You must proclaim the good news. You must be uh, courageous and you must stand in your integrity or you have nothing at all. And I speak to you, Jehovah's Witnesses, ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, if you're not speaking out for the truth. And ex-Mormons and ex-Adventists and ex-Catholics and ex-Lutherans and ex-secular worshipers. I speak to all of you, the entire world. You must make a decision now or else with the fiery expectation of the judgment that is coming upon the world and you'll be left without an excuse according to the Apostle Paul. Because what you did to others you deserve to have done unto you. This is the basis for the judgment that's coming. Jesus was saying, I personally, Jesus, am not going to punish you. Jehovah is the one who is punishing the world for their misdeeds. So we've got Jehovah himself that says, if you don't say what I'm telling you to say, if you misspeak in my name, I'm going to destroy you. All right, so they've got that against them because the ruler of this world is coming, Jesus said, but he has nothing in me. But you see, the ruler of this world does have something in them because they believe in him. They believe in the ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the God of this world that blinds the minds of the unbelievers. They don't believe in Jesus. They're unbelievers. They believe in Jehovah and Jehovah has already stated that he will punish them when he arrives. Isn't that an irony? Jehovah's laws that they so, you know, desperately believe and cling to are the very laws that is going to destroy them.
because Jesus will not do that. He loves them and he continues to stand and, and, and reach his hand out and say, please stop. I told you don't be a hypocrite. I told you to love one another. If you give, you shall receive. That's his law. Love. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But Jesus did say, on the other hand, if you judge others, you will be judged by the same judgment. So even Jesus has judged Jehovah's Witnesses worthy of the exactly the same judgment they're declaring that the world will receive, which is eternal destruction from his presence. So, if you're a Jehovah's Witnesses and you, after watching this video and you find out that you were wrong and you're not only wrong, but your organization is teaching false prophecy and you deserve to be put to death for that and you don't repent of it. And if you judge the entire world worthy of something that is, you know, they weren't worthy of, like say you say, uh, you go and you, you slap somebody, right? They're, they didn't deserve to be slapped. Jesus says, if you slap somebody, they don't deserve it, you're going to get slapped. So, if you condemn everybody to eternal destruction, then isn't it logical that you will receive eternal destruction? Although, thank goodness, there is no eternal destruction. There is simply age lasting. They will be destroyed, and they will not be in the presence of the Lord and all his holy angels with all the saints. For a thousand years, they will not get to enter into his kingdom, but they will remain and be judged under the laws of Yahweh in his kingdom. And they'll receive whatever judgment Jehovah seems or deems fit for them. So it's interesting that Jehovah's Witnesses have ignored this because everyone knows that we have a conscience. In fact, one of their governing body Freddie Franz wrote a book, Crisis of Conscience. Any of you ex-witnesses should read that because he tells you that they lied, they did all these things. But he doesn't, ex he doesn't go into it as deeply as we're going to here. But the point is that if you're a Jehovah's Witness and you're not quite sure if it's the truth and you're just going to see if you can just slide through just acting, maybe being inactive or not saying anything because you don't want to lose your family or whatever. You don't want to speak up for the truth. So what you're doing is you're supporting an organization that's condemning everybody to death. That's not just hypocrisy. That means that you are literally going to receive the judgment that you're putting upon the rest of the world. So let's say that you're, a, you don't want to say anything and you got children going to the kingdom hall and their mother goes to the king, but you don't believe it and you don't say anything. You don't teach your children properly. You let their mom teach them. Well, then you're allowing your children to be taught. And it's the same thing as you teaching them yourself because you know in your heart and your conscience you need to stand up and tell your children the truth about the love of Christ. But if you're allowing them to go to the kingdom hall and go from door to door and stuff and, and, and spout this evil condemnation upon the entire world that they're all going to die and be destroyed and be unworthy of eternal life, then you yourself will be unworthy. Because you see, you've neither received Christ and his free gift of eternal life. You haven't gotten on your knees and prayed for the Holy Spirit. You haven't helped the homeless or gone to the water of life and drank from this fountain of truth and believed it and received it in your heart and helped, you know, which would, the proof of your reception of his Holy Spirit would be that you'd go out and feed the hungry and give shelter to those who are homeless and and heal the sick, and cast out the demons. And you didn't do any of that? See, casting out the demons would be the lies, but you didn't say anything about the lies. You didn't help your family know that what they were doing was believing in lying spirits. And therefore, you didn't cast out the demons. And you let people that were sick believe in the government, who said, oh, hey, take this medicine that, that literally is going to kill you. Well, it's, you're not just a coward, but you are literally heaping coals of fire upon your own head. You will receive judgment for what you're doing. And so this is critical if you know the truth, or even if you're suspicious and you don't further investigate, but you condemn, continue to condemn the world, you will be worthy of that condemnation. So this is why it's so very, very important.
But anyway, I'm looking down in well over an hour, and so we're not going to be able to go any further with this video today. I had a few other things I wanted to mention and talk about, but maybe we'll get that in in another day. I'm going to go ahead and go, guys. May the Lord bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a good one.